Shalom and welcome to this edition of Revealing the Truth, where we cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. I'm your host, Messianic Rabbi Eric Walker. The world is brutal and awful, full of vicious, cruel, and miserable people who take their misery out on others. From a young age, best-selling author and world-famous speaker Ron Archer knew more than anybody that the horrible realities of this world were all around him. Our next guest is an author, inspirational speaker, and business executive who brings hope to those who have seen and felt it all, the pain, the grief, and dismay of this world. In this uplifting story of determination, grit, and the rise of the underdog, readers will learn how he overcame an extremely painful and tragic upbringing, and how he turned it into good for the glory of God's kingdom. From the very start, he had all the cards stacked against him. After surviving an abortion, his teenage mother's <coughs> pimp forced her to have. He was born prematurely with a string of health problems. Rejected by his physically abusive stepfather, he was overweight, a bedwetter, and mercilessly bullied for stuttering. He coped by banging his head into the wall every night until he fell asleep. At the age of 10, he tried to commit suicide, but the gun didn't fire. He never felt the comfort and love of a parent, that is, until he was taught about the unconditional love of his Heavenly Father. In his new book, you'll learn how God can transform your pain into power and misery into ministry, that every single person is born and conceived with a divine design, how God uses the suffering in this world for his good, why sometimes our greatest blessings are hidden in our greatest challenges, and how you can single-handedly change a life by mentoring others and showing God's love. This is a success story of a man who not only overcame his troubled and painful childhood, but also used his suffering to encourage others to trust God in all things, whether big or small. You'll laugh, you'll cry, but most of all, you'll be inspired to never, ever give up. Dr. Ron Archer is an author, world-renowned inspirational speaker and business executive, as well as a leadership trainer for corporations in the military. He has also advised several U.S. presidents. Born prematurely in a ghetto of Cleveland, Ohio, to a 17-year-old single mother and call, go call girl, he grew up as a severe stutterer with a string of health problems and learning disabilities. His life drastically changed when a teacher stepped in and showed him the love of God. Dr. Archer has traveled all over the world to preach and share his incredible life story. In 2014, a YouTube video of his testimony at the Gideons International Convention went viral and has reached more than 9 million people online. Here to follow up on his interview from February to do part two about his new book is What Belief Can Do is Dr. Ron Archer. Ron, welcome back to Revealing Man the Truth. Man of the mighty God of Israel, Christians, the universe. How are you, sir? I am well, thank you. Uh, through the blessings of God, we have pressed through circumstance to uh, continue to bring the message of uh, reconciliation, the message of healing, the message of hope, uh, the message of endurance in the face of overwhelming odds and the trials of fear, but yes. showing the compassionate love of a God that still wants his message to go forth. As a matter of fact, I think he's set people down. And the very word for the day is be still and yes. know that I am God. Yep. So here we have an audience that they can't go anywhere. They can't do anything but be glued to find inspirational teachings if they have a desire to uh, look at these circumstances and break free of what's holding them back. And uh, I believe you have those answers. Well, thank you, sir. I also, I like to quote what David said in the 23rd Psalm, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pasture. This is a time where I think God is imposing his divine will on his children to be still and to know that he is God, to lie down in green pastures and to be in a state of abiding. That's a word we don't use much anymore. It's an old English word, but it's the kangaroo in the pouch and being connected to that which gives us our strength. The vineyard and the vine example in John, 14, that God is allowing, my beloved brother, an opportunity for us to really ab 
abide and be still and be close. And like what Moses said, look at these Egyptians who are chasing you, for ye shall see them no more. Stand still, see the salvation of our God. And that's where we are. We're being still, we're standing, we're going to see God's mighty salvation. Praise God. You know, the more you talk about um, he makes me, in Psalm 91 says, he who dwells. And to be honest, to be honest, we've used that as a, um, oh, uh, a Tylenol when we have a headache. Uh, <laughs> but the truth of the matter is we don't dwell. And to claim Psalm 91 and to say that we do dwell, right now is the first time since 1952 uh, polio. Uh, was the fear of the day uh, when I was born. Yes. And uh, this is the first time that I can remember that people are being forced to dwell in the presence of God. And now Psalm 91 has relevance and meaning, not as an anecdote that I take an injection because I've got an infection, but I now have no choice. I must dwell in the presence of the Most High. And he talks about pestilence. And yes. this COVID virus, that's what a pestilence is. It's, a, yep. it's, not, it's not the hail, it's not the frogs, it's not the lice, it's not the cattle disease, not the boils, right. that's a plague. This is a pestilence. And this is defined yeah. in every dictionary as a contagion, a contagious disease that permeates all indiscriminately. All of so now we must dwell in that place so that we can come under his protective covering. And you know what's so amazing? When Solomon finished the temple and he asked God for a blessing, God gave him a very interesting retort. He said, if I shut up the heavens that there be no rain, if I send locusts to devour the land, if I send pestilence among my people, then of course, the one we all know so well, if my people who are called by my name, but God gave him this progression of judgment. First, I'm gonna shut up the heavens, which creates a drought. That's the first sign when the blessing stopped flowing, when the money stops flowing, when the favor stops flowing. He is trying to get our attention in that level one pestilence or effect. Then number two, whatever was left behind by the drought, he sends locusts. There are over 20 million locusts right now in Kenya and Uganda heading to Pakistan and even over to China. And then he said, if that doesn't get your attention, then I'll send pestilence among my people. It's almost progression. First he stops the blessings, then he sends the locusts. What you think you can hide from him, he's going to have it devoured. If you don't repent, you don't give me time, you don't stand still, I will then send something to touch you and make you stand still because you have no choice. And that's where we are right now. God says, do I have your attention now? Or as we say in the hood, how you like me now? <laughs> how do you like me now? You know, it's quite interesting you refer to the dedication of the first temple because this was the first time that a prayer was offered in intercession on behalf of the Gentiles. Mm. And King Solomon interceded and he said, he said, if the stranger, mm. that one who does not belong to the house of Israel, who offers his prayers no matter where he is in the world, and he faces this place, I ask you, Lord God, to incline your ear and hear mm. their prayer and answer them, though they not be of the house of Israel, that they wow. should recognize that Jerusalem, the city that bears your name, and this place yes. that bears your name and your presence, that you would give grace to those that are not family, that are not of the bloodline of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so all of a sudden the kingdom becomes open to those that would remember and recognize that facing east towards Jerusalem, 
right, would be the place of our answers. We see that counterfeit ah. in Islam yes. Uh, yes. As we, uh, and it's a pure counterfeit, but this was the dedication and in this dedication and intercession, mm -hmm. the door was open that said, and so if you look historically, you'll see that almost every church and I know that every synagogue in its design is built to face Jerusalem. Amen. Every, every church architect will always wow. take that piece of property and he will position it so that it faces towards Jerusalem because of that prayer. You know, I often tell people who are in despair and they're stressed out and I say to them, do you know since Roe versus Wade, became a law that over 62 million babies have been killed and murdered in the womb. That was my story, that my mother was a call girl and her pimp said, you can't make any money being pregnant and they tried to abort me three times. And people don't understand that killing babies is an old ritual back to Baal worship in the Old Testament where you would bring a young newborn or a baby and put it in the hands of this statue that was the head of a bull in the hands of a man and they would burn it up and they would play drums so the parents couldn't hear the screams of their infancy. And to think God Almighty is going to deal with the worship of Baal and deal with the Philistines and deal with all of these things that happen. And I, I mean, I have a scar on my arm today where the hanger poked me when I was in the womb and was born premature. And I know God is a God of grace and a God of mercy, but he's also a God of justice and a God of responsibility. And I say to people, the Lord says, I am the Lord God, I change it not. And we cannot expect to allow these atrocities to occur and think God is not going to speak, not, not to allow his justice and his righteousness to roll down like a mighty stream. America needs to wake up. We need to wake up because, you know, we sing a song, um, God bless America. He already has. It's time for America to bless God. Amen. Amen. You went through a very, very difficult season in your life <clears throat> that made you realize that your blessing was on the other side of breakthrough. Yes. And most people curse the obstacle in their life. And we can list the obstacles in your life. A premature yes. birth, a three, yep. a, 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 a three failed abortion attempts, stuttering, uh, bedwetting, uh, being bullied, all these things that were right obstacles. Right with a broomstick by a babysitter. All of this, as, and, and we could curse every one of them, and you could be one bitter bitter, uh, child-abusing, wife-beating individual, mm. but something happened. And what happened in your life, the answer which was delivered to you, handed mm. to you, right? as if God had said, this is your moment, I'm going to place yes. the answer in your hand, but, but, like any tool, like the shovel that sits in my garage, if I don't take it down, I can't stand in my yard and curse the ground for not opening itself up to receive a tree if I leave that shovel hanging in the garage, if I don't use that tool. But you took that tool and you read that tool. Yes. How did that come about? That teacher, what did they do? I'm gonna tell you something. I was in an inner city school. My family, was atheistic, meaning there was no worship of God and no Bibles and no praise and worship. But I believe something that when you cry out in your desperation and in your agony, as I did, as I wanted to kill myself, I believe God hears the cries of the broken and the bruised and the battered and the lost. And he will send a ram in the bush. And in my inner city school in Cleveland, Ohio, he sends this white Southern Baptist Gideon Bible carrying woman of God who asked the principal for the worst students in the school. 
He said, well, I got somebody for you. He wets the bed, he stutters, he can't learn. We have no hope for him. And she said, let me have him because God don't make no junk. And that woman named Mrs. Spears embraced me with love. And she talked like this. She came from Mississippi. And she said, hi, baby. I'm going to help you talk. And I said, okay. And she used the Bible as the tool to help me articulate into a tape recorder. And the first scripture she gave me changed everything. You gotta understand, I view myself as a mistake. I view myself as a trick baby. I view myself as an accident. I view myself as unwanted, an illegitimate child. And for the first time in my existence, I hear something else. I hear from Jeremiah chapter one, verse four, and God said to Jeremiah, before I formed you in your mother's womb, I knew you. And before you came forth, I set you apart to be a messenger for me. And when I read that and Mrs. Spears explained to me, it didn't matter who your parents were. It didn't matter what your mom did. God Almighty took his hand and placed you in your mother's womb for this season. And she said something that was so powerful. She says, do you understand that God uses greatly those who've been wounded very deeply? The greater the wound, the greater the compassion you will have, the greater the sensitivity you will have. And she said, there's one person I want you to study. When you take this Bible home, memorize his story because it's going to be you. The story of Joseph. And when I read about Joseph, this young guy who gets lied upon, put into a pit, sold into slavery, he's in prison. I mean, everything that could go wrong went wrong in his life. And when he finally got elevated to a position of authority, as we call exousia in the Greek, his brothers who tried to kill him and then sold him show up because they're in a famine. And she said, I want you to always look at life through the lenses of Joseph by remembering what he said to his brothers. He said, do not be up upset with yourselves or don't be afraid because you did not put me here. God did. Why? To save many lives. What you meant for evil, God has used it for good. And that became my roadmap. That became my eyeglasses, my lenses, to look at all that I had been through. And I learned something, that everything I had gone through was a down payment on my destiny. I can relate to the broken. I can relate to the abused. I can understand the crushed. You see, if you don't use your suffering for good, it's just suffering. But when you use it for good, it's fertilizer to have other people grow. And God elevated me through that wonderful teacher named Mrs. Spears and her Gideon Bible. I do a lot of fundraising for the Gideons because it was that Bible that opened my eyes for the first time to the truth of the mercy and grace of God and that nothing just happens in the kingdom of God. So that was transformative. And then my prayer became, Lord, use me. Not to become a great evangelist, not to change the world, not to be on TV or have best-selling books. Lord, use me to lead my family to you. They're so broken and so hurt and so abused. They're drug addicts and prostitutes and, and criminals and no sense of values, no morals. Lord, would you please plant me in this family to be a light for your glory so I can lead them to Christ. And it, it was tough, man. These were hardcore people. My mom would get mad at me sometimes for going to church all the time. So I was preaching at 16 at the Good Shepherd Baptist Church. So she would say, before you go, mop this floor. I would go, yes, ma'am. And she would, you know, oh, you're afraid to put water. She would dump the whole bucket on the floor. She would hide my keys. I said, mom, I'm done. I gotta go preach. She said, you can't find your keys? Let Jesus find them for you. It was, <laughs> it was that kind of insanity. And, uh, and so I just, but I knew one thing, and this is so true. Listen to me, guys. It's not doctrine. It's not how well you speak. It's not how well you preach. It's the life you live. The only thing that would convince my family 
that God was real was the transformation of my head, my heart, my hands, my habits. And when they saw God elevate me, bless me, I became the first black student body president of an all-white military school. Same thing in college. Graduated with honors. Made a million dollars in business at 28. All of a sudden, they looked at this kid who was nothing and broken and battered and bruised and suicidal. And the hand of God touched my mouth, gave me his words, gave me his spirit. And they saw a complete 180. And my uncle Buster said, who was a drug addict at the time, he said, you know something? And he said, there's something about this Jesus thing because you couldn't walk and chew gum at the same time. And one by one, my family got saved. So I want people to understand something. You are like a tea bag. You don't know how strong you are till God dunks you in hot water. He doesn't dunk you to harm you. He dunks you to release what he put inside of you, his presence, his power, his, his personal, all of these things, his promises. And you were designed to be dunked in your job, in your family, in your community, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And there are certain things that can only come out when you're dunked in hot water. And I realized that at that time and said, God, here I am, dunk me. And everybody in my family today is in ministry. We have a place of hope. We do counseling for presidents, for leaders around the world. But it all started with one thing. The devil thought he buried me, but he forgot I was a seed of God. And when you bury a seed, it's not a funeral. It's an expectation of a breakthrough, of growth and fruitfulness. All of those who hear my voice, when you feel buried, when you feel overcome, when you feel deep down in the mud of life, remember one thing, you are a seed of God. And what was meant for evil, God will use to generate fruitfulness that will feed generations for the rest of your life. The deck was stacked in your favor, but only God knew what he held in his hand. Amen, brother. Yes. And he speaks so clearly about the blessing to the overcomer. Yes. He says, to the overcomer, I reserve the right to sit at my right hand and Man. eat from the tree of life. People are so prone to moan and groan and complain about their circumstance. Yes. And they ask the question, and this is something that, that I, uh, I've been uh, speaking over this entire season of this uh, isolation that people are in, this, this uh, quarantine. They're all asking, Lord, how do I get out of this? How do I get out of this? And they're asking the wrong question. The question should be, Lord, what do you want me to get out of this? And if yes. we would just pursue the heart of God in these quiet mm. times, not be looking at the television set, not be looking at the news, not be watching these, these, these uh, press. Uh, I actually got so tired of it, I canceled my cable. I said, I've had yeah. enough. Uh, uh, no more. Uh, uh, not going to do it. Not going to listen to it anymore. God wants me, one, on the treadmill, and two, Amen. with earbuds in, listening to his word, because he wants to talk to me, right? and he wanted me to drop some pounds. So I okay. said, you can talk to me while I'm working out. And he said, all right, we got a deal. But you have shown, and you actually have an acronym for storms that I think is really quite powerful. And people don't see it this way. They see the storm, they run for shelter. When they're already under the covering of God, why right. do I have to run? Yeah, I, you know, the, 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 the acronym for storm, first, the the preamble of life is this. Either a storm is right with you now, just leaving or on its way. So you can't avoid them. They can be financial storms, they can be physical storms, they can be marital storms, or they can be a pestilent storm, but we all are going to face our storms. And storms means significant trauma, overwhelming, reasonable minds. But the only way you overcome a storm is not by running from it, by running to it. 
The reason that David was able to defeat Goliath is that he remembered the anointing on his life. And the Bible says he ran toward Goliath. He didn't run away from him. He ran. The only way a plane can take off and break the rules of gravity is by turning into the wind, turning into the storm. We have got to face it. You know what happens when you face it? You get to experience the presence of God, the power of God, the reality of God. If you can handle everything yourself, you don't need God. I've learned something, my friend. When God calls us to do something, it is always bigger than our intellect, bigger than our capability, bigger than our resources. But this is how you experience God, by having your storms and know he's a shelter. He is aerodynamic. He allows you to go and you learn that the joy of the Lord is your strength. So the one thing that Mrs. Spears taught me, she says, you can't change who your parents were. You can't change where you were born. You can't change your complexion or your ethnocentric ideological disposition. But she said, the one thing you always have control over is your attitude. Attitude. The attitude of hope, the attitude of faith, the attitude of belief, the attitude that everything I've gone through is a down payment on the destiny because attitude determines your altitude. You know, attitude is not really a psychological term. It is a aerodynamic term. It's when a plane is in the sky and it's flying and the tower says to the pilot, what's your attitude? Doesn't mean if you're happy or sad. Where is the nose of the plane against the horizon of the sky. If the attitude is just tilted above the horizon, something called lift happens, and it takes you above the clouds. It takes you above the storm. You transcend that which you thought was going to kill you. You become an overcomer. You become a flyer in the power of God. But if it's too high, which is arrogance, it'll choke out. If it's too low, you'll crash. So it's just lifting your head to which cometh your help and understanding your God is God. And it lifted me. It lifted me. Every time these negative thoughts came, I realized something. I choose to be joyful. I choose to be thankful. Because you know what I learned? I cried when I had no shoes till I saw a child who had no feet. Yeah. It can always, the one thing I, I hope people can do is travel. Get outside of the beauty of the United States. I lived in Africa for three years. I worked in India. I've been to South America. I've been to a place called Koreama in Kenya, where one million people live in a closet-like existence next to each other. And there's such poverty, and there's such degradation, and there's such filth. Our poorest people in America are middle class in most places in the world. So we need to understand when you're in a pit, and right now people are in a pit, like Joseph was, the word pit is an acronym. When you're in a pit of depression, a pit of poverty, a pit of brokenness, remember what pit means. P-I-T, profit in training. Hmm. God is allows life to do things to you, grip you, rip you, strip you, flip you, then dip you, equip you, and ship you. But when you're in that pit, whining won't get you out. Being a victim won't get you out. Blaming the white man, blaming the black man, blaming this one and that. God says you ain't learned nothing yet. It is when you're in the pit and you tell God, all I want is you. If the rest of my life is spent in this pit, if you're with, with me, I'm good. All I want, I will bless the Lord at all times. And when you turn your pit into a praise center, when you turn your cell into a sanctuary, when you're like the Apostle Paul who was in the inner prison and they turn that into a revival center, when God understands you want his heart, not his hands, then he elevates you out of the pit because you're ready to go from the set time, from the meantime, to the appointed time. And you learn one thing, it's not about you, it's all about him.
Amen. Here I am, Lord, send me. Amen. Ron Archer, <clears throat> author of What Belief Can Do, who took his scared hand and put it in his scarred hand. Hallelujah. And God pulled him out, out yes. of every obstacle you can think of. A story of overcoming, a story of faith at work, a story that has a beginning, but it has no end. Hallelujah. It's an ongoing developing story of the power of God until he breathes his last. Ron Archer says, I will praise him all day long. Yes, yes. We're going to take a short yes. break, and when we come back, we're going to talk about how you don't have to be Ron Archer, but you can enjoy the blessings of God. You can enjoy deliverance. Oh, yes. You can enjoy a new attitude, a new yep. altitude, a new outlook in spite of your circumstances. Yep. The will of God will never lead you where his grace cannot keep you. Hallelujah. We're gonna Amen. Short, we'll take a short break and we'll be right back with Ron Archer. The Lord meets you right where you are and so does Igniting Nation's new live streaming outlets. You can now watch Revealing the Truth Revealing the Bible and Prophecy Revealed, simulcast live each Monday through Friday from 10 a.m. to 1 o'clock p.m. Central Standard Time on YouTube Live, Facebook Live, Vimeo, Periscope, and through our website, www.ignitinganation.com. No matter what device you are using, our program will automatically scale so you won't have to miss a single program. And if you happen to miss an episode, you can always subscribe to the Igniting a Nation YouTube channel and access over 1,000 interviews and never miss your favorite authors, special guests, and topics that interest you the most. There are lots of ways to see Israel, but nothing compares to seeing the land of the book and the people of the book through the eyes of two Jewish believers who can take you on a journey that will bring the entire Bible to life. When you join Rabbi Eric Walker and his number one rated tour guide, Edo Canaan in Israel, you'll experience incredible teachings, first class accommodations, and actually walk where Jesus walked. You will experience the Bible transforming from black and white into living color, and you will never see the Bible in the same way again. For more information, visit us at www.ignitinganation.com forward slash events. The Lord contends with what contends with you, and Igniting a Nation is committed to bringing to light each and every issue that faces a believer's life. Our live stream programming and teachings take you on a journey to finding biblical truth from a wide variety of experts who share their insights into a deeper walk with the Lord. We have assembled the most comprehensive panel of experts in the fields of prophecy, caregiving, healing from trauma, shame, and abuse and so much more. We continue to expand our teachings and programming to meet your needs. We're committed to healing the nations with biblical truth. Visit www.ignitinganation.com to develop a deeper walk with the Lord and start your journey to a transformed life. The Bible commands us to study to show ourselves approved, but most study using Bible study tools and not actually studying the Bible chapter and verse. Igniting a Nation is pleased to present Revealing the Bible, recorded and taught each week before a live audience. We take you deeper into the actual Bible and verse in both Hebrew and English and connect the dots between the Old and New Testament. You can attend our two classes in Tuscaloosa and Birmingham or watch the program every Wednesday at 11 a.m. Central Time on IgnitingAnation.com and all our other simulcast outlets. For more information, visit www.IgnitingAnation.com forward slash events.
Shalom and welcome back to this edition of Revealing the Truth, where we cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. I'm your host, Messianic Rabbi Eric Walker, and we're talking with Ron Archer, author of the new book, What Belief Can Do, How God Turned My Pain into Power, and Tragedy into Triumph, and How He Can Do the Same for You. Ron, welcome back to this segment. Thank you, kind sir. Thank you. Ron, as we read in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, that anyone who's in Christ is a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. And God has called you into a ministry of reconciliation, calling Amen. you to reconcile God and man together. And you've been on a mission of reconciliation in places like Ukraine, Africa, all throughout the world. And in your testimony, you spend a certain amount of time setting the stage for what you went through, but that's not the focal point. The focal point of what you have to share is what God has done for you since he delivered yes. you. What God has done in your life since you came yes. out of all of those circumstances. We can tell the story of the I lived my life as a troll under a bridge, but that's not power. Right. The power is, is that this is what God has done for me. For me, yes. a Jewish man in the last 24 years since I said yes to Messiah. Not the first 44 years in the synagogue, but what has he done for me? Yes. So as you go out and you talk to these communities and you share, the Word of God says that we are overcomers by the word of our testimony and the blood of the Lamb. Hallelujah. Yes. As you address these people from every background, from every walk of life, from every circumstance, none better, none worse than the rest. They're all bad. They're all impoverished. They're all in need. They yes. all don't have the Lord. Therefore, they are bankrupt, they are on a path of destruction. Yes. What is it you share with them? The first thing I try to communicate to them, one, it's not where you start. It's where God can take you. Two, to understand it's not an overnight transformation to go from A to Z. It is a process. And I give them the four M's that transform my life that they can apply to go from the pit to the pinnacle, the outhouse to the White House, to understand it is a journey. And the first M is meekness. You need to be broken under the mighty hand of God to say, Lord, I got so much baggage. Uh, you might be an alcoholic, you might be a drug addict, you might be suicidal, but it is the first is to surrender, to surrender and say, Lord, help me. Lord, help me. I can't, but you can. So the first M is meekness. You come to God in a meek spirit. You bow yourself before him and you ask, you beg, you plead for his presence, for his mercy, for his grace. The second M is a word we don't use much anymore, but Mrs. Spears taught me this. It's the word called mastication. Mm -hmm. And mastication is an agricultural word that describes a cow chewing its cud over and over and over again. And she told me, don't try to read the whole Bible. Focus on one scripture for now and chew on it and chew on it. Masticate, get every drop, every chlorophyll taste, every ounce. We, 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 we can be a mile wide and an inch deep. You need to spend some time in the word of God reading it, not just to preach it or to teach it, but to chew on it and allow God to speak to you. The word I remember chewing on is, how can a young man keep his way clean? By taking heed according to your word. Your word have I hid in my heart that I may not sin against thee. So meekness, mastication, then memorization. What saved my life mentally when I had all the garbage and the abuse in my head was memorizing 2,000 scriptures, putting it to memory, 
putting it chapters and verses and chapters and verses. And it did a couple things. One, I knew the Bible very well. But two, I developed a photographic memory. So now when I talk about business issues or lecture on Aristophanes, Euripides, Cleisthenes, and Pericles, climbing the Acropolis, meeting the Parthenon, there is nothing I cannot see that I can't recall. Things 30 years ago I can recall like it was yesterday because of the memorization of the Word of God. So I want people to come to God with meekness. Then you may have a salvation verse, so one verse that really inspires you, and you just, you just eat on it and eat on it and eat on it and chew on it to every drop of blessing and understanding can come. Learn to, to do exegesis. What does this word mean in Greek or Hebrew? And you can go online. There's all kind of tools now you can use and begin to just, oh, I didn't know that. Like you said about the hymn, many wings. Revelation comes. So you, you have meekness. Lord, I need you. I'm a chew on your promises. I will never leave you or never forsake you. I'm a friend that's taken closer than a brother. If God be for me, who can be against me? I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Just begin to memorize and memorize and memorize. When you have the meekness and you have the mastication and you have the memorization, then it creates motivation to be to do, to become, but it comes from having the meekness, chewing on it, memorizing it. Then the word becomes flesh. You go from orthodoxy to orthoproxy. You go from just talking about it to being the living word, being the grace. You see, I believe, for example, the fruit of the spirit. I look at it differently in triadic teaching. The first three things, love, joy and peace is what you get from your abiding with God. When you pray every day and you're before God, you receive his unconditional love. He knows the worst things about you, but he would die again for you. You receive his joy that you are an overcomer, that greater is he that is in you than he is in the world. Then you receive his peace, a peace that no man can give and no man can take away. So you get those three from your relationship with God. The next three is what you give. You give out patience. You give out kindness. You give out goodness. You get to give. And the third three, you become. You become humble, faithful, and self-disciplined. So you get to give to become. You get, you give, you become. Now, there's a place, you've been to Israel many times, of course, so have I, the Dead Sea. Why is the Dead Sea called the Dead Sea? It receives fresh water every day by the gallons or liters from the Sea of Galilee, from the River Jordan, every day, fresh water. But it is stagnant. It is dead. Nothing lives in it. You know why? Because it takes, 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 but gives nothing out. For water to live, it's got to circulate. It's got to move. And when God blesses you, you've got to give it out. That's what makes my life so joyful. Not just what I went through, but what I have become, what I do for others. My greatest joy is not what God has done for me, is what I now can share with that single mom who's pregnant. Honey, come here. And, 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 and the joy of helping that young kid who's suicidal, working with football players, presidents, because everybody has pain. Everybody has a storm. Everybody is difficult. And my wife is here. Come here, baby, real quick. I wanted to say hi. She's right here with me. She is my best friend. She plays music. Say hi, everybody. This is Rachel. Hello, Hello everyone. Rachel. This is, Hello, this Rachel. is the gift God gave me. When man finds a wife, he finds a good thing, and he finds favor with the Lord. Her mother led me to Christ. So I'm. Mwah. we've planted 53 churches around the world, and this is my best buddy right here. So God will bless you. You never know, okay? Thank you, baby. Mwah. Bye. Nice to meet you. God bless you. So I'm just saying. <clears throat> It, you, you oh, now I'm gonna tell you, now I have a pet peeve. Here's my pet peeve. When I know people have been delivered, they've experienced the grace of God, they've been set free, and yet they still don't forgive others. They're still judgmental. They're still mean to others. That tells me you have not really experienced God. 
You know, there was a woman, let me tell you this story. She raped me with a broomstick. When you get violated as a young boy at nine years old with a broomstick, you learn four things. Don't talk, don't trust, don't feel, and try to pretend it's not happening to you. She would have a party and bring her drunk friends over. And they played a game called pin the tail on the donkey. They would strip me of my clothing, hold me down, take the broomstick and say, squeal, donkey, squeal. I'm bleeding. I have splinters. I'm in agony. That woman who abused me, who tore me apart, came to my church broken. Oh, I could have stomped on her. I could have had my deacons throw her to the snow. But I knew God had spared my life to be his ambassador of forgiveness and restoration. And I helped her come to Christ, help her find a job. Because if we do not do that, we don't understand what Jesus said on the cross as he was hanging there, bleeding, suffering in pain and agony. The people are mocking him, selling his garments and the devil's dancing a jig. And yet in the midst of his agony and in his suffocation and in his torment, he looks out and sees the mass of humanity that has done this to him. And he says, Father, forgive them. We are most like God when we can forgive those who've hurt us and betrayed us and abused us and dropped us. So don't tell me about how great you can speak, that's fine. How wonderful you can sing, oh, that's a blessing. Or how rich you've become, that's okay too. But when you can forgive, now I know you have met my God. <laughs> when you can have a soft heart, even my mom who didn't know how to love me, early on. She didn't know. Never been loved in her life. And God said to me, you can no longer look at her as your mother. Look at her as a woman who needs me and need you to be the first man to ever love her. And I embraced my mom and I took good care of her. To this day, I take good care of her. And one day that love broke the hard heart that was in her from so much abuse herself. And she said, honey, it brings me to tears sometimes. She says, honey, I'm so sorry. It's hard to give what you don't have. And she said, honey, I said, what mom? She said, you just don't know how people will treat you when they know you have no place to go. Hmm. I was treated like an animal, beautiful woman. Oh my God, like Liz Taylor, Sophia Loren, Holly Berry for the younger generation. And my mom was broken. No man had ever loved, she had been molested when she was 12, turned out at 14, a prostitute, 16. She never knew love. She never knew. All she knew that men caused her harm. And I understood that. And I began to love my mother and restore her. She's my best friend. So in you, if you can experience the grace of God and the mercy of God, you get it not to be the Dead Sea. You get it to be living water to pass it on with humility and mercy and kindness, and it changes lives. That's what I've learned. 
God is no respecter of persons, and therefore <clears throat> each and every one has the capability to walk through the fire, to be pressed, to be sifted, to be like the silversmith when asked, how long do you keep the silver in the fire? Is there mm. a set time? He says, no, there's no set time. She says, then how do you know when it's refined? He said, when I can see my reflection in it. Preach. And you and I have traveled through refiner's fire. We've yes. known betrayal. Yep. We've known abandonment. We've known rejection. We know the price that had to be paid yes. for our redemption. And we had to be willing to pay the price and count the cost of saying yes to Messiah. Yes. But God who gives exceedingly and abundantly beyond all expectation says, seek me. Yes. And I will show you, call mm -hmm. upon my name, Glory. and I will show you wonderful, marvelous things that you could have never imagined. Amen. Ron Archer, in your life, you have walked through the fire and come out the other side scarred, mm. but not wounded. Amen. Cut, Amen. but not hurt. That's it. Broken, but completely healed. Yes. You fit the description Paul gives us in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, that we put no stumbling block in anyone's way because of our ministry, but in good report and bad report, in good times and bad times, when I am broken, I am made whole. When I am poor, I am made rich. Amen. I can do all things. Glory, hallelujah, yes. yes. Through my Messiah, who strengthens me. Can I say this to your audience and to you? We all have strongholds from our abuse and from our journey. And the one that was the last one to drop off of me, that my mom carried, that, that affected me the most, was shame. Mm. Being ashamed. My mother was ashamed of her life. She was ashamed of me for a long time because I was this reminder of her life. And I carried that. And for a long time, I vowed I would never talk about my life. I became a PhD. I became a guy that understood open space technology, affinity diagramming, and appreciative inquiry. But my first book is a business book, became a bestseller but had nothing about me. When I would preach my sermons or talk, I would never talk about me. I had no inkling to ever share my life. It was embarrassing, it was humiliating, I wanted to forget about it. And it wasn't until I turned 50, I'm 56 now, where I was witnessing to a vice president of a bank who was a Gideon. Mm. And I was sharing all of this deep, you know, psychological stuff and the tick reactivating system and all that jargon, and it didn't affect him. And this man was suicidal because he had been molested as a child. He never told his wife about it or anybody else about it, and I knew then I had to come clean and drop the bravado of Dr. Archer and become Ron. And I shared my story with him. And God did a miracle in his marriage and his life. And he said, you know, I'm a Gideon. You need to tell this story in our convention in Philadelphia. I said, oh, no. <laughs> no, 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 no. He says, all the other stuff you have done has been a platform for this one moment to tell what God has done for you. Amen. And I said, okay. 
And what I want people to be encouraged by, I got up to speak, 20,000 people there, now 9 million people. But here, here's what's happened. The thing that I was ashamed of, guess what? It's now in a book and they're making a Hollywood movie out of it to lead more people to Jesus. The thing I was most ashamed of, the thing I was never gonna talk about, the thing that I was embarrassed of, God, that was the very thing he was waiting on me to become, to take it to a whole new level. So you know what I'm telling your audience? Stop being ashamed. Tell your story. Share what God has done for you. We run a special here <clears throat> on the second Friday of every month called Overcoming Shame. It wow, is, didn't know that. It is uh, hosted by Dr. Mark Baker, who's an expert on overcoming shame, who believes that shame is where our sin response comes from. And when we remove yep. that shame, we break the chain yep. that's tied to it. We've been talking with Ron Archer, author of the book, What Belief Can Do, How God Turned My Pain into Power and Tragedy into Triumph, and How I Can Do the Same for You. He is an overcomer by the word of his testimony, the blood of the Lamb. No matter what you've been through, no matter what you're going through, God has an exit strategy. Yes, he does. To take you out of where you are, to take you where he wants you to be. And you just have to say yes to him. That's it. Ron That's Archer, it. God bless you, my friend. Thank you for sharing another precious hour with us here. I look my forward genius. to seeing you again sometime here, sometime there, wherever. May the Lord make our paths cross even more. You are a blessing in my life, my friend. God bless you and your bride. Thank abundantly. you so much. Thank you. We're going to take a short break, and when we come back, we'll bring you the next edition of Revealing the Truth.